So today is the <clears throat> appearance of his Divine Grace Silvokti Vinod Thakur, one of the stalwart Vaisnavacharyas, who is considered the father of Lord Chaitanya's movement in the Western world. So one of the songs that he popularized, which we as a society sing daily, is Jaya Radha Madhava. This particular bhajan is, uh, as Srila Prabhupada described, is the complete picture of Krishna. In the sense that this is Vrindavan, Jaya Radha Madhava, Kunja Bihari. Gopi and Janavala Giri Varadari, Jasodanandana, Raja Janaranjana, Jamun Tiravanachari. Now these four lines are actually two lines, four principles, Jayarana Madhava Kunja Bihari, Gopi and Janavalava Giri Varadari, Jasodanandana. Braja Janaranjana Jamunatira Vanachari. Krishna plays in the Kunj Jayarada Madhava Kunjabiha. He enjoys loving pastimes in the groves of Vrindavan Jayarada Madhava Kunjabiha. Gopi Janavalava. He gives unlimited and new pleasures to the gopis. Giribhada Dari. He is the elector of the Govardhan Hill, known as Giridari. His Soda Nandana, he is the bliss, the happiness of his mother, his Soda. Brajjana Ranjana, he gives pleasure to the entire area of Braj. Jamuna Tira Vanachari, uh, he sports on the banks of the Jamuna with his friends. Jamuna Tira Vanachari. So these are the four lines of Krishna's pastimes with his, you'll see there's, there's Madhuryaras, Sakyaras, Matsayaras, all mentioned in these four lines. Very sweet. Please sing with enthusiasm. Yeah, I'm gonna 
Namaste Saraswati Deve, Nongravani Pucharine, Nir Visheshna Sunyavanadi, Pasyatya Deva Sitarine, Ramakam Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Mustaya Bhutaya, Srimakti Vakti Siddhanta Saraswati Iti Namine, Sri Varshavana Videvi Daite Kripabdaya, Krishna Sambandha Vigyana Vindayane Prabhavena Maha, Madur Ojwala Premadya, Sri Rupa Nuga Bhakti Da, Sri Gola Kurunda Shakti Vigrahaya Namostate, Namaste Gauravani, Sri Mortaye Dinatarine Rupa Nuga Virudapa, Siddhanta Dwanta Harile, Namo Gauriki Shuraya Saksad Bhairagya Mortaye, Vipalamba Asambode Apalambu Jayate Damaha. Namo Bhakti Vinodaya, Satchidananda Namine, Gauda Shakti Sarupaya, Rupanuga Varayate, Gauda Vibhava Bhume, Swam Nir Desesa Sajanapriya, Vaishnav Sarvabhoma Sri Jagannathaya Te Namaha, Vanchakal Bhakta Rubis Chan Kripa Sindhu Vaidhacha, Vitaram Bhavane Gyo Vaishnava Gyo Namaha, Sri Krishna Chaitama,
So between appearance and disappearance, both are equally transcendental, but one is has a little extra emphasis on it, and that is disappearance. When the great soul comes into the world, his activities are not yet spread throughout the general population. So it takes time to, before people get to know and benefit from the association of such a person. But upon their disappearance, everything is glorifiable because then they leave behind their teachings. Well, today is the appearance of a very special personality, extremely special, very fundamental, a key person in bringing about Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission to the Western world. And that is his Srila Bhakti Vinoda Kura, Namo Bhakti Vinodaya, Sanchit Ananda, Namine, Gaura Shakti Sarupaya, Rupanuga Varayate. He is, he is uh, Gona Shakti Sarupaya. He's the form of the embodiment of the energy of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is Krishna himself. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Radha Krishna Nai Anya. Radharani and Sri Krishna himself of Sri Vrindavan Dham have come together in one personality as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So his teachings, his mission, everything, uh, his appearance are fundamental to the upliftment of the entire world. Without the presence of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his movement, this entire world would no longer be existing probably. People are so sinful that everything would have been destroyed by now. But because of the presence of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement in the world, the world goes on and it also has great hope. Um, Shiva Bhakti Vinod Thakur appeared around the, around the time of 1830s, 38, something like that. 1830s, yeah. And uh, he was born in the Shakta family. That means worshiping the energy of the Lord. There is those who worship the Shakti energy of the Lord, such as Durga Devi and her expansions, Chandi, Vijay, and various other manifestations, Amba. It's like Bombay. Bombay is called Bombay. Where did the name come from? It came from the British because the name actually was Umba, Umba Devi. That's the actual name of the original name of the place that Umba is worship Umba Devi, and she is also an expansion of Durga Devi. But they couldn't say Umba, so they say Bomba, and then it became Bombay, because <laughs> it was a bay right there. there. <laughs> um, so the British have really given us great amounts of uh, wrong culture. <laughs> Some of us like the British and some of us really hate them. <laughs> we have this dichotomy. <laughs> I know one person who just mentioned the letter word British and he starts going into a long diatribe of how, how they ruined India. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, some people think they contributed to India. That's subjective. <laughs> but Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he appeared, and he was, and for many years, he grew up in a village in, in uh, somewhere in Bangladesh, not Bangladesh, but in West Bengal. Much on the border of Bangladesh and India. Yeah. That time it was all India, one India only. Yeah, Bangladesh was not known as Bangladesh. And uh, at one point in his life, I think when he was in his 20s or a little bit later, he came across a copy of Chaitanya Charitamrita in the Bengali language. 
and he started to read it. He was always interested in scholarly presentations on philosophical teachings, spiritual knowledge. And after coming in contact and very much understanding deep a little bit about the uh, pastimes and activities of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he became really inspired. Studied the book, read it many times, and started to become a follower of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu left the world in 1534. And after that, for about a hundred years after that, Lord Chaitanya's movement was still somewhat strong. We read about the famous uh, Ketri Ground Festival that happened in 1574 in a place called Ketri Gaon. That was the birthplace of Srila Naratam Das Thakur. And after that, of course, there were Janava Devi and uh, many, many of the followers of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who continued his movement. Baladeva Vidya Gusama, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, and many other acharyas came. But gradually, Lord Chaitanya's movement started to lose steam. And it was also diverted away from its, its essence by many people who claimed to be followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, but were teaching something different. And they, uh, they became quite popular. And 13 main groups started to arise. Ao, Bao, Jad Goswami, Sati Bedi, Chudakari. That was some of the other ones. Jad Goswami, we said that. Vityananda Vamsa, Garanga Nagaris. And 13 groups, all claiming to be followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, but actually were teaching and practicing something different. Sahaja, that was also another group. So many of them were seeing Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement as something material and uh, really destroyed the whole teachings in, in, in a very significant way. But for 150 years after, uh, from, the, from the year, from the end of the 1600s to the early point of the set of the 1800s, Lord Chaitanya's movement was lost. It's practically gone, and these other groups became more and more prominent. So it wasn't until Bhakti Vinod Thakur, after discovering Chaitanya Charitamrita, realized what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who he was, and what he had brought. And then he became very enthusiastic to bring back Lord Chaitanya's movement in a very meaningful way. So he wrote many, many books and many, many periodicals, articles. He also started a regular newspaper. <clears throat> and he was writing a lot about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's philosophy and his life. In the year 1869, he gave a very powerful speech called the Bhagwat. Many people in India were somewhat unfamiliar with the Srimad Bhagavatam, and a lot of people were thinking. It sounds like very nice stories, folklore. Their grandmothers would tell the children, the grandchildren, stories at night from the Bhagavatam. I mean, it was more like going to bed stories, you know. Those of you who lived in the village, you probably uh, had some experience like that, or at least your parents did. So this went on. But when Bhakti Vinod Thakur also began to study Srimad Bhagavatam, he understood that this is Amalam Purana, or that Purana which is pure, which teaches the essence of pure devotional service without any mixture, just like it says in the second verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, hmm. Let's see. Kira, uh, uh, what is that statement? Just slip my mind now. That's the third verse. Second verse. Dharma 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 Projita Kaita Parama Nimapsarasam Satam. Dharma 
Prozito. Prozito means to kick out. Uh, Kaitava means cheating. The Bharma, Dharma kick, uh, Bhagavatam kicks out all cheating forms of religion and establishes the, the real principle of religion, which is unalloyed devotion to the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna and Sri Vrindavan Dham. So uh, then he spoke very powerfully in an assembly of many important people in that, in that year. And also that speech was later transcribed and put out as a small booklet, which is also circulating, circulating around ISKCON of today. And uh, so Bhakti Vinod of course started to write many, many books. And in 1869, he finished one particular book called The Teachings and Precepts of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, or Lord Chaitanya, Teachings and Precepts of Lord Chaitanya. It's about 96, 98, 100 page book, small book. It's also available. And he took that book, made some copies of it, and sent it to many of the major universities around the world. Later on, it was discovered by some of the devotees of Srila Prabhupada in one university in Canada called McGill University. Okay. And McGill University. And that book is somewhat of an, a cogent, very cogent, very precise, what we say, summary of the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And it's interesting because that book went around the world in the year 1896. And it's interesting because it was somewhat prophetic because in the same year, 1896, was the birth, day, birth time of his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. So the same year that the book and the teachings went around the world, the person who would take the book and the teachings around the world appeared the year 1896. So this is all orchestrated on a higher level. In other words, this is Krishna's plan to bring real religious principles into the world. Teachings of, so if we study Lord Chaitanya's teachings, we will understand what is the essence of the Krishna consciousness, our spiritual life in general. And those teachings are there in various scriptures, especially in the, in the teachings of the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Chaitanya Bhagavad, Chaitanya Charitamrita, Chaitanya Mangala, and various other smaller writings in glorification of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Bhakti Vinod Thakur was facing a lot of the propaganda given out by these Ah, sampradayas. We say ah, ah in front of sampradaya means not sampradaya. That sampradaya that goes on as something authorized, but it is not. This is the material world. Remember that. And so cheating, lying, and various types of activities go on on all levels, all the time. If you believe the news, you will be stupid <laughs> because they give you lies because it's all about economic gain and not about giving you information they give you some information it's by accident <laughs> this is the, you have to understand this is kali yuga kalir dosha nidi rajan it's an ocean of bad qualities this age <laughs> Never put your faith in the materialists. They will always cheat you. Always, only put your faith in the devotees of the Lord, and especially in the pure devotees of the Lord. Then you will never be cheated. Bhakti Vinod Thakur was up against a lot of this propaganda and that was teaching something different than Lord Chaitanya's true teachings. And so he was writing books, also giving speeches, trying to reestablish. He also was very instrumental. In fact, he was the main person who rediscovered the birthplace of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It had been lost 
in time, and no one knew where it was. In fact, they thought it was on one side of the Ganga, they thought it was on the eastern side of the Ganga, but when later on Bhakti Vinod Thakur very scrutinizingly studied the maps that were available at the time, and after studying them, he could understand that the birthplace that was being said was not the actual place. And then he pinpointed it into another place, and he just happened to see that in the place where he understood where Lord Chaitanya's birthplace was, there was a huge mound of Telsi plants that were growing profusely in that area. And then he made his declaration. And then by showing through the maps and his studies, it was understood that this was the real place of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's appearance, which is now there in Shidam Mayapur. Now you could go, it's called Yoga Pete, the actual appearance place of Sri Chaitanya, the home of Lord Chaitanya, where he grew up with Sachimata and his father Jagannath Mizir. He's still right in that same area. There is a nice shrine in the tree, the mean tree that Lord Chaitanya was born under is still there. People come and take the dirt and dust from that tree and they eat it, and they put it on their bodies and they collect it, worship it. So it's still there. So that was Bhakti Vinoda Kaur's contribution, one of his main contributions to Lord Chaitanya's movement. One night, he was looking in the area of Lord Chaitanya's birthplace. He was just looking, gazing out, and something happened. A vision appeared. It wasn't a dream, but a vision. In that vision, he saw something really prophetic. He saw people from each of the five races, the brown race, black race, white race, yellow race, and red race, they were all together singing and dancing Jai Sachinandana, Jai Sachinandana, Jai Sachinandana. And he could understand someday a great personality will come and take the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu all around the world. Lord, Ch Lord Srila Prabhupada's presence in the world is predicted three times. But even though Thakur's prediction was the third one, the first one was predicted by Krishna himself more than 5,000 years ago. It's written in one Purana, I think it's called the Ramanda Purana. I'm not sure the exact name of the Purana. I have it written down. And Krishna speaks to Ganga Devi herself, the personification of the Ganges River. He said, so, he said, within the next 5,000 year, a personality will appear. He will be called Mantra Upasaka. And he will take the chanting of, the, of my holy name to every town and village. That's was spoken by Krishna more than 5,000 years ago. So Prabhupada's appearance in the world was not some just, you know, some ordinary appearance. It was the plan of the Lord to bring pure teachings of Krishna consciousness to not only which was there in India for, for millions of years, but now to take those same teachings and bring it to the entire world. And here we are sitting in, in North Carolina. <laughs> so this is uh, this was prophetic. And uh, so Srila Prabhupada's appearance and of course Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also in a dialogue with Sri Narada Muni also describes that a great person will come and uh, will take my message everywhere throughout the world. So what we have here is not some religious movement that somehow appeared among so many other religious movements. This movement is meant to re-spiritualize the whole world. It's not about just worshiping the Lord. It's about Prabhupada said our movement is to change the whole world from bottom up, economic, uh, economic, political, social, ecclesiastic, everything, architectural, any all of this great sciences 
will undergo a great revolution and come back to the original standard because all the great sciences in the world are coming from the Vedas. Yeah. Vedas is the source of all knowledge. Veda means knowledge, but that knowledge, Teni Brahma Hida Adi that knowledge was given to Krishna from Krishna to Lord Brahma. And the Vedas are coming from the body of Lord Brahmaji himself as he realized Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead through his deep meditation. So, and Srila Bhakti Thakur fought relentlessly to bring about Lord Chaitanya's movement back after he had been lost for 100, about 150 years. And that loss was actually a curse. The story of Vamanadev is actually the foundation to the curse of why Lord Chaitanya's movement was lost for 150 years. I don't know the exact pastime. I had heard it from Jai Pataka Maharaj, who told it many, many years ago. I heard it about 15 years ago. But it was connected with Sukacharya's curse upon Bali Maharaj for refusing to follow his instructions. Um, that particular curse was um, the manifestation of that curse would Lord Chaitanya's movement would be lost for a certain period of time. It goes all the way back to Vamana Day. It's interesting. If you speak to Jai Pataka Maharaj, I'll tell you the story. <laughs> it's not a very popular story, and popular in the sense that it's not so much circulating around. We don't know much about it, but it's there in the in the Shastras. It's an interesting, it's a particular story. I think what it was, Sukracharya changed his form into a, into a, a fly to block Bali Maharaj's pronunciation of giving to Vamanadev. And because of that, Vamanadev took a straw and poked that fly and blinded it in one eye, right? Yes. You, know, you know the story, yes. right? Yeah. And because of that, Lord Chaitanya's movement, somehow it's connected and was lost for 150 years until Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur again brought it back. And then when Bhakti Vinod Thakur was trying to reestablish it, he realized he couldn't do it himself. He prayed to the Supreme Lord, please send me a ray of Vishnu, someone from the spiritual world to assist me in this mission. Lo and behold, later on, he found out it was his own son, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, who was born Bimala Pushad in the year 1874. How he discovered it was his own son is a very interesting story. Bhakti Vinoda Kaur had gotten the position of taking care of the Jagannath temple. When the Jagannath temple had gone down, the offerings were not on time. A lot of the organization that was there years ago had been lost. Bhakti Vinoda Kaur took up that position and restructured and rearranged Jagannath's uh, prasadam, everything about Jagannath's worship was again brought back to standard by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. So he was living in Jagannath Puri. He had, he had a house on Grand Road. It's still there. You can see it. And one day, well, not one day, but he was called away for some business. He had to leave Puri. <clears throat> Around just before that time, his son was born, Bhimala Pushad. And the Jagannath Rathiyantra was going on. And so the carts were going down Grand Road and they stopped, Jagannath stopped right in the front of the house of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. And his wife, Bhagavati Devi, she took little Bhimala Prashad, who later became Bhakti Siddhanta. And he was only six months old. She brought him onto the cart and she placed him at the lotus feet of Lord Jagannath. The little baby is there. Now Jagannath's huge. He's two meters high and one meter wide. <laughs> That's, this is like the miniature Jagannath here. <laughs> but he's still Jagannath. 
whatever size he appears in, he's still the absolute personality of that thing. Maybe you should, no, no, I better not say anything. <laughs> so when she placed him there, Jagannath decided to perform his pastime. So the garland that was around the neck of Jagannath, which is a huge garland, fell and landed in a circle around the baby. And then his wife, she was amazed to see that. It was a special blessing given by Lord Jagannath. And later, when her husband, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, returned, she told him the whole story. Then, only he realized, oh yes, my prayer has been answered. This personality that I prayed for actually has come into our own family. Shula Bhakti Siddhanta. Later, he was Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj. And, we, and by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj's determination to send, he created an army of sannyasis. He had more than 60 sannyasis, and even more than that, preaching and traveling all around the continent, subcontinent of India, opening up temples, preaching Lord Chaitanya's mission, establishing Panapinas, that is the footprints of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, because Mahaprabhu traveled all over India and spread Krishna consciousness when he was here. The devotees asked Srila Prabhupada, he said, Srila Prabhupada, Lord Chaitanya was God himself, and he brought Krishna consciousness very powerfully to the Indian subcontinent. Why didn't he take it all around the world? That was the question they asked Shiva Prabhupada. I said, he left it for me to do. <laughs> because Krishna can do it. Krishna can make the whole world Krishna conscious. It's not for him, it's not hard. But he doesn't work like that. Because Krishna consciousness has to be voluntarily accepted and not forced. We are also forced by circumstances, but Still, the choice remains to become a devotee or not become a devotee. Krishna does not interfere with our free will. But uh, sometimes he puts, he gives a lot of extra mercy to encourage us to take up devotional service. And sometimes his mercy comes in, in the form of suffering. It's another form of mercy. Just like now, preaching is ever is so good, better than ever. All glories to we call coronavirus, we call it Karuna. It's very merciful. Karuna has become Karuna. Karuna has become Karuna. <laughs> Karuna means what? Murder and magnanimous, right? And sometimes they say COVID, but we say COVID. <laughs> COVID, COVID means whatever it means, I don't know. But COVID means highly intelligent. <laughs> Those who are highly intelligent are called COVID. <laughs> and so, but it's interesting you know, how Krishna plays games with words. <laughs> uh, he's controlling everything at all times. So always remember that Krishna is the supreme controller. He controls everything at every moment, everywhere, all the way down to the slightest movement of the material energy. Everything is under this complete control of Krishna. But he gives us our free will. And therefore, we can accept his control or we can try to work against his control. That's our choice. If we accept his control, then we are no longer controlled by the material energy. We are controlled by the spiritual energy, which means the energy that gives freedom, happiness, and transcendental knowledge. We can accept how we want to be controlled. We cannot become free from control. We can, can be controlled by the material energy under the, uh, under Durga Devi. Durga Devi is not known to be very merciful sometimes. <laughs> she carries a trident, threefold miseries, Adi Yatvika, Adi Vautika, Adi Daivika, miseries of body and mind, miseries of other living entities, and miseries of higher powers. And she's stabbing the living, the 
the living entities with these threefold miseries. And these are the sufferings that we undergo in this material world. They're called clashes. You can't get away from these three people. Some think we want to make this material world a nice place. Forget it. It's not possible. Durga Devi is there to make sure. If you want to make it a nice place, become Krishna conscious. Otherwise, material life means suffering. So, therefore, that's the mercy manifestation of the Lord in that particular form. So, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, he preached in such a powerful way that many of his sannyasis did amazing work in spreading Krishna consciousness all over India. But one such person who was a householder who really didn't associate so much directly in the ashram was our spiritual master. Srila Prabhupada was a householder. He had five children. He had three girls, three boys and two girls. And he was a grihasta, but he gave it all up. And in around the, the year 1930s, he started to move away from household life and took up preaching in India. But inspiration was Bhakti Siddhanta had told him in the year 1922, you take this mission of Krishna consciousness, this, this, this philosophy, this lifestyle, you bring it to the Western world. He gave that instruction to all his leading preachers. Some went to London, some went to France, some went to Germany, some went to Mayander, Mayander was known as Burma at the time, and other places around Asia. They all came back with practically no results. Something happened in London. But basically, they didn't have any really... But Prabhupada, when he took it to the Western world, he was empowered in such a way that he was successful in bringing people who had no interest in organization. They had interest in spirituality, but they didn't. They were the most unorganized people in the world. That was the hippies. You talk about organization, you have committed offense, you know. Most rebellious. Most rebellious. Because we used to, there was one book called Rebel Without a Cause. <laughs> it was a famous novel. <laughs> Rebel Without a Cause. Rebel for the sake of rebellion. That's all. Don't trust anyone over 30 years old. <laughs> <laughs> we spoke about that last night. And then, But I was believing that too until I became 30. Then I had to rethink the whole thing. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe it doesn't, maybe it works for a while, but. So, but Prabhupada, he picked up people from a most obscure background, people who had no Sukriti, who were not interested really in doing anything in the mode of goodness. <laughs> but they had some interest in, in spirituality, and this came through the, the hippie movement, which was, was a lot of psychedelic drugs, LSD, you know, marijuana, you know, various types of drugs. I forgot hemp and various other types of, you know, self-induced uh, spiritual experiences with drugs. <laughs> when Prabhupada was talking to one, what we say, hero of the hippie movement, his name was Allen Ginsberg. And he was telling Prabhupada, you know, we can smoke marijuana and we can also chant Hare Krishna. And Prabhupada said, you can also have a spiritual experience through these drums, but it's not lasting. You have to come down. So Prabhupada's teaching during that time was chant Hare Krishna, stay high forever, never come down. <laughs> That's what he was teaching during the, the hippie movement to somehow convince people that drugs, I mean, you can also get some experience, but at the same time, you have to come down again. And then again, when you come down, it's worse than before, before you went up. <laughs> Each time you come down, it's like hell. So 
that's why the hippie movement, the, the people were staying high all the time. <laughs> Don't come down. But then again, that's not so healthy either. So this is what Prabhupada had to deal with. And so Prabhupada, so Bhakti Vinotar Kaur was that person who brought back the teachings of Mahaprabhu in a very powerful way, writing so many books, establishing Lord Chaitanya's birthplace, uh, again giving popularity to Lord Chaitanya's movement. Bhakti Siddhanta took it from there, created an army of preachers and spread it all over India and sent one person. He sent many persons to the Western world. One was successful, and that was our Srila Prabhupada. So you have to understand that these three personalities, Bhakti Vinoda, Kurvati Siddhanta Saraswati, and His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vinoda, Swami Prabhupada, were all empowered by the Lord to bring these teachings of Lord Chaitanya to the Western world. Now it's up to us to carry it further and ultimately complete the mission of Lord Chaitanya, which he said in every town and village, my name will be chanted. Bhakti Vinod Thakur had wrote, wrote so many wonderful books on the science of pure devotional service. Srila Prabhupada, when he would speak about the writings of Bhakti Vinod Thakur, would encourage us to read the books of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. He didn't encourage us so much to read the books of his spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. In fact, he never did. But Bhakti Vinota Kaur was writing for the Western mentality. And one of the books that he wrote was Jaiva Dharma. Perhaps you've come across that. It's a very interesting presentation on the complete science of pure devotional service taking one through the, the nine stages of bhakti all the way up to the highest form of pure love of God into the more intimate moods of devotional service. And the science that surrounds the whole process of elevation from one stage to another. And to make the book interesting, because if you sit there and you read philosophical teachings for a while, you think, oh, what am I reading? It's like two it's too complicated. He put, or you can't remember when you're done. He put it into a dialogue where he created a setting with a with a, a chela. Chela means devotee or disciple looking for a spiritual master. He finds a spiritual master and then he's getting teachings in increments on the path of devotional service. And there's a whole setting, there's a whole social and political activities are going around this whole thing. So it becomes very, very interesting read, Jaiva Dharma. Please read that book. It's been published by the Gaudiya Mantra and also by Islam Society, especially. It's a beautiful book. It's long. <laughs> it's about 500 pages, maybe a little less. But it's also available free of cost at Iskan Desire Trade. I just sent a link to the book, but it's yeah. free of cost. Free of cost. You can just download the PDF and read. Yeah, you can read it if you want to read it uh, in that way. It's available. I have read it twice, but I think I would like to read it again. It's so interesting and so nicely explained. And another book by Vati Vinod which was also recommended by Srila Prabhupada, is Chaitanya Shikshamrita, which is a lot of the principles to, in execution of devotional service, but it also talks about Krishna and Vrindavan and Krishna killing the various demons and what these demons represent and the different uh, anarthas. Anartha, anartha comes from the word artha. Artha means that which is wanted or auspicious. Anartha means the opposite, something inauspicious, something unwanted. So the living entity in the material world comes to the material world with so many anarthas. And these anarthas are personified by various demons that were killed by Krishna and Sri Vrindavan down during his time there. So reading that particular section, you get a deeper understanding of what the anartha is, what demon represents that anartha, and how one can kill the demon of that anartha in the execution of one's devotional service. 
sometimes we see we struggle with something and we continue to struggle with some particular uh, bad quality or something about our character we don't like or something we're forced to be to forced to engage in um, but these can be removed when we know how it comes what in the, what are the, what are the symptoms and how it can be removed and this is all explained nicely by bhakti Vinod Thakur in uh, Chaitanya Shikshamrita, another very wonderful book by Bhakti. And of course, Krishna Samhita, which is a, a complete explanation of the Srimad Bhagavatam, taking it canto by canto and describing it. So Bhakti Vinod is one of the most prolific Vaishnava writers of transcendental knowledge. And uh, he's written over a hundred periodicals, books, articles, various types of smaller editions. Um, his works are just studied by, by all those who are, you know, practicing Krishna consciousness, Vaishnava culture. So it wasn't, we would say, the appearance of Bhakti Vinoda Kaur and the work he did set the stage for the reemergence and the pro proliferation of uh, Lord Chaitanya's teachings. Mm -hmm. uh, today is his appearance day. And so, and in our Krishna consciousness practice, uh, who can think of, I'll ask some questions now, who can think of the things that, that Bhakti Vinod that Kaur gives us that we do daily in our Krishna conscious practice? Gaurati. Gaurati. Jaya Gaura Chandra. That is a beautiful rendition of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when he was at the Mahaprakash Leela for 21 hours. The Lord came out of his role as a devotee and took the position of the Supreme Personality of God and he accepted worship from all his devotees. That lasted 21 consecutive hours. And during that time, there was an arti performed in glorification and that arti became what we know today as glorarti. Kibajayo Jayagomu Chandra. It's beautiful, one of the most beautiful songs by Srila Bhakti Vinoda Kaur depicting this historical event of Lord Chaitanya being worshipped by his devotees. And what's another one? Sarira Ravijaja Jyotendriya Tehikahachi Vekpilei Visaya Sagare Tarna Deji Kalayati Lomba Moya Siddhura Matita Kritita Kutina Samsare Krishna Bhara Doya Moya Kali Pala Jeeva Jaswa Prashada Dilopa Sayanam Vitapa Oh! Radha Krishna Guru Ga Oh! Premina Kau Chitanya Dekai Jai Dimai Dekai Ektina Shanti Pode that's the next, there's two parts to that prayer. We don't sing the second part, it starts up. Ekdina Shanti Pode, I can't remember the rest. I haven't sung it in years. Glorifying that, you know, at the house of Advaita Charya, he's distributing prasadam to all the Vaishnavas. So it's a beautiful song. Uh, prayer to honor the remnants of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Sri. Krishna Prashad. Uh, what's another thing? Yasomati Nandana. Yasomati Nandana. Thank you. 
Now we must mention that was one of the favorite bhajans of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. In fact, he asked for that bhajan to be played during his disappearance just before he left the planet. He liked that bhajan very much. He's got the whole you know, Krishna in one minute. Yeah, it's all, it's all there. It's a beautiful. Prabhupada very much liked the devotees to sing that. And from time to time they would. And then, of course, you know, we have uh, what else? Bhakti Vinod Thakur and Jaya Radha Manavu, Kunja Bihari, Mopi Jana Vallava, Giri Vada Dari, Jasnoda Nandana, Braja Jana Jana, Jamuna Tita Brahmachari. All these beautiful, beautiful. Bhakti Vinod Thakur has composed one work called Saranagrati, where he has written hundreds of bhajans. And glorification of Lord Chaitanya, Krishna, and the process of pure devotional service. So it's actually a very good idea <laughs> to come together as a group and make one night, and you can do it, you can do it in a scheduled way, bhajan night, and just do bhajans. You can read the translations after the bhajan and maybe someone can also comment on it but make you know make make have a bhajan night it just purifies the whole and then you these bhajans are very very deep in bhakti very deep they go really into the heart of bhakti because they're sung with great great enthusiasm and great great devotion like bhakti vinoda kaur lochan das kaur shiva naratam das kaur and also, there's a few very wonderful bhajans by Srila Rupa Goswami also. So we have a wealth of what we say, Vaishnava culture and literature given to us by, by Srila Prabhupada through the works of the great Acharyas such as Bhakti Vinoda Kora and others. Uh, we don't need to watch television. <laughs> Your television away. <laughs> Somebody used to say that they would say the television is a, they would call it the idiot box. You've heard that term? Yes. Idiot. But we don't say that. We say it's a it's something, it's a box that's watched by idiots. <laughs> It's not an idiot box, it's a box watched by idiots. A box which is making everyone idiots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
but there is Radhanath Swami in one of his lectures in India. I was there at the time. This was a long time ago. He said, what the uh, what Islam couldn't do to India in 800 years, what the British couldn't do to India in 200 years, television did it in 20 years. years. Yes. Completely changed the whole culture of India into this dog, dog dancing culture. I said dancing dogs. <laughs> so, Bollywood, they, they, wanted, they named it right after Hollywood, Bollywood. I have witnessed myself, Maharaj, and and, in our villages, we used to do Kirtan, and now everybody just goes in front of TV when they get in. Yes, yeah, it's just like, the, in the village culture was at night, people would come together and hear Ramayan or Mahabharata or, you know, even Srimad Bhagavatam. Some people would go to sleep in Prabhupada said they would dream about Krishna's pastimes. Now what do they dream about? <laughs> hmm. Some guy <that> gets stabbed. <laughs> so India has been corrupted by the Western door culture. Don't bring in, don't think that this Western culture has anything to offer. It is simply, it's just simply sense gratification and it's becoming more and more degraded. There's nothing here. Vedic culture is actually human culture. When one begins spiritual life, they begin human life. Human life begins, we, sit, we say that people are not human until they actually take up spiritual life. Before that, there's, they look human. <laughs> Two-legged animals. Eating different ways, sleeping different types of places to sleep, mating in different, and they, they get really crazy about that. Mating and then defending, you'll see, where do we spend all the money on? Defense. All the people's taxes go into these big, big uh, programs for defense. So most of the money, billions and billions of dollars go into defense because Defense means protecting our eating, sleeping, and mating. <laughs> That's what defense is <laughs> so-called. A Vedic culture means uh, understanding deeply who you are and your relationship with everything, not just the Supreme Lord, but with each other and with the material energy also. So that is the thing. So this movement is not simply a spiritual movement. It's a movement to re, as Prabhupada said, to restructure the entire human society into the values that are of human, human values, real human values, which are the most of goodness. So Bhakti Vinota we glorify his work because he did so much to bring about what we have now as Lord Chaitanya's movement. He is the father of Lord Chaitanya's movement. Sometimes we say grandfather. Okay. So uh, there's a beautiful book written by one of my god brothers whose name is, uh, give me a moment here. From London. He wrote Seven Goswami and also the life of Bhakti, the life of Bhakti Vinoda Kaur, the life of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, Rupa Vilas, yeah, Rupa Vilas Prabhu. And he also wrote the life of Haridas Thakur. And tomorrow is the disappearance day of Shiva Haridas Thakur also. So, uh, yeah, in that book, The Seventh Goswami, Bhaktivedanta Kaur, is, his whole life is nicely given in a very succinct and very uh, easy to understand way. You get a chance, get that book. It's called The Seventh Goswami by Rupa Vilas. It's been out for more than 20, 25 years now. Okay, here's a little bit about Bhakti Vinoda Kaur. Any comments or questions on anything?
one one question uh, we have seen historically that all the empires like roman or even in uh, bharatvarsha there were so many empires that at the period of time they got destroyed organization got destroyed over a period of time so as a practicing devotee and follower of iskon what we need to do to make sure that the movement which is started by shila gopal is going to sustain for a longer time yeah by teaching that same legacy to those who are coming into the movement now let them understand deeper who shila prabhupada is what he gave and how to keep his teachings you know foremost in our activities what you say is indigenous in the material world what is that indigenousness that if you don't work too hard to keep something it goes down maintenance is not simply uh, establish once you establish something to keep something you establish you have to work to keep it it's true with anything if you if you learn music and you learn music and you keep playing it if you stop for a while you start to become less you know we say good at it and it starts to go down if you don't speak your language for a while you forget it right? Right? probably some of you have forgot some of the hindi right <laughs> i can say that yeah so anything you don't maintain by keeping active towards that it will go down that is the material world prophet also said in order to stay krishna consciousness it's like swimming upstream swimming upstream means against the current the current of the current of this material world is to bring everything down that's why you see the ages such a yuga the golden age and then you have treta yuga for dwarpa yuga and now we're in kali yuga the worst of the the lowest of all the four ages so when kali yuga keeps coming it'll go lord chaitanya's movement is here but it'll go down at the end of kali yuga it'll be so degraded here prompt said this is not Prabhupada, it's actually Bhagavatam. And people will live 20 and 25 years old. If you live 25 years old, you'll be a grand old man. The, the duration of life will be destroyed and people will be no better than just ordinary animals. This is this is the future of this world. It'll go down and down and down. And then Kalki will come and kill the, the remaining demons. And then he will usher in the new age, which will be such a yuga will start again, and there'll be an age of enlightenment again. That's the nature of this material world. It goes down. <laughs> you have to fight to keep it up. So, yeah, keeping that legacy of Srila Prabhupada alive by teaching and empowering the, the youth in our society to take it up in a very serious way. That way we can keep it going with them. If we if we don't, you know, give it to those who are coming into it, if we simply just keep it for ourselves and expect them to learn themselves, then we are we are cheating. We are actually not uh, able to keep Prabhupada's movement alive. So you have to fight. Once you establish something, you have to fight to keep it. And you have to fight to expand it also. It's a struggle. Yeah. Yeah. So, during the uh, course of the class, you mentioned, Maharaj, that most of the people who have some kind of authority or some kind of respect in the society are trying to cheat someone for their material benefits. That's Kali Yuga. You could expect that. So it's the age. Yeah, everyone is in this age. Bhakti Siddhanta said there's two kinds of people in this age: the cheaters and the cheated. So either you're cheating or you're being cheated, or you're a combination of both. <laughs> That's all. But you also mentioned that we can trust the devotees, they can uh, take us to the path of Krishna consciousness. But how do we know that uh, 
Because in India, there are so many Babas and Sanyasis and other people who are taking us in all possible directions. Yeah. And then finally, we realize that they are only for city purposes. Right. So, how do we, a new devotee or a new person who has not much uh, information, knowledge, will be able to trust? For example, two devotees from this congregation are trusting me. How do they know that I'm not? Trust is something that doesn't come automatically. You have to gain trust, you have to build trust. You have to show by example that you are trustworthy and what you're saying is what you're living. If you're not living what you're saying, then people will, you know, see that there is a dichotomy between what you say and what you do. And that is, that is Prabhupada said, teacher, T-E-A-C-H-E-R, change the letters around you, that's C-H-E-A-T-E-R, cheater, same letters. <laughs> So, yeah, Kali Yuga is like that. Kali Yuga means people. Mm, there's a beautiful story which illustrates Kali. It's in the Mahabharata, actually. It's a very long pastime. I'm not sure if I should tell it right now. But it's really long. But it illustrates what this age is about. It's about lying, cheating, hypocrisy, and so many bad qualities. When you, if you find someone with good qualities in this age, it's rare. Even good people are drawn into act in the wrong way simply by the, by the atmosphere of this age. It's such a bad age. And it's getting worse. You can't believe the government leaders when they speak. Because you know... They're only saying what they want to say, they want you to hear, but behind the scenes, there's a whole different thing going on. And this is what's happening with this pandemic. You know? They're telling, they're scaring everybody to, people are so fearful of this so-called virus that they're, you know, can't even function anymore. I'm afraid to, to go out and socialize with others. It's all propaganda. That's all it is. Why? To control people. When you control, fear can creates confusion. And confusion means you don't know what to believe or what not to believe. And then whatever comes into your purview is, can be accepted in order to get rid of the fear. So don't be fearful, Chen Hare Krishna. <laughs> if you take shelter of Krishna, and I, I, I'll tell you a story. There was one young man, he was just new to Krishna consciousness, and he was in jail. So supposedly the COVID uh, virus went into the jail and he got sick. And he really got sick. And so, the jailers, they didn't give him no treatment, nothing, nothing. He didn't get any help at all. He was left on his own. So, but he had contact with devotees and he had some understanding. So what he did is he went and started to chant and he chanted and chanted and chanted. And after some time, he freed himself completely from the disease with no treatment at all, simply by chanting. I have that document that he wrote it in a letter and explained it in detail, what he went through and how simply by not only chanting, but he was calling out to Krishna in a very helpless way for Krishna to save him. And Krishna did, with no medical treatment at all. Because they don't care. They figure if, if another person in jail dies, that's one less problem to worry about. That's how they see you know, in jail with this, you know, so um, if you take shelter of Krishna's holy name, this virus will not touch you. But don't be careless either. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying that what has been given to us as some threat of life is not what it is. It's much less than what it is. It's just like any other disease that's been going on for years and years. Every year during the flu season, people get flus. <laughs> And people don't. People die of flu, people die of virus. It's been going on for years. And all of a sudden, now there's only one disease. Isn't that amazing? 
is only one disease. Do you believe that? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> and so this is all propaganda for economic gain. And, you know, people are making billions, not just millions, but billions of dollars on this whole so-called pandemic. So be careful, like we do always be careful when we, you know, we always take care of our health. And there's ways you can do that and just be careful, that's all. And uh, if you live a, a healthy lifestyle, that means be regulated in your, in your, in your habits. Regulation is the key to health. It's the foundation for health. The health comes on top of that. If you are unregulated in your eating and your sleeping and your activities, then you're putting your immune system in a challenging way. And then when your immune system goes down, even the slightest amount of difficulty can cause sickness. Keep your immune system. If you give you a good immune system, you won't get sick. I had COVID supposedly back in October of last year. And in one week, I treated it with just, I didn't go to any doctors or any hospitals. I just treated it myself. I got some advice and I didn't have any of the symptoms that people say was the actual symptoms of the virus, but I was told I had the virus, so I believed it. <laughs> but, and 99% of the people who have gotten so-called COVID have been cured. 90, this is statistics, it's not just something. You know, because what they say it is, is not always what it is. It could be any disease that looks like something that looks similar to that. And every day I'm hearing people, they tell me, oh, I got COVID. And then I hear, how are you now? I'm fine. I got all work. <laughs> every day I get these reports. So, but just be careful, like we always are careful, keep you, keep you, keep strong and chant Hare Krishna. Chanting Hare Krishna is a sadi, a nature, a sadi maya, nasi bada lagi, hari nama, maha mantra, lao tui magi. That's Bengali. Asadi means medicine. Lord Prabhupada said, this medicine of the Hare Krishna mantra can cure anything. <laughs> <laughs> Material disease, spiritual disease, and something in between. Chant Hare Krishna. But we won't chant Hare Krishna. We think, what am I, my grandmother used to do that when she had no time, but I'm busy, I got a job, right? <laughs> I can't have, I don't have time to chant Hare Krishna. I gotta make money, but who's making money? Government, they make money. They print it, they call it money. Nobody else is making any money. <laughs> So, take time and chant Hare Krishna. To use myself as an example, for the last four years, I don't do anything until I finish 16 rounds. Nothing. I don't eat. I don't interact with people unless it's an emergency. I chant 16 rounds before I do anything. And I find that that is very, very helpful in everything. Chant those 16 rounds if you made that vow, or what if you've made some numerical vow, keep that vow and chant early. That's because early rounds are the real powerful rounds. And you'll see this, this chanting of Hare Krishna is very, very powerful because it's Krishna himself, it's non different. Even though we might not be purely chanting, if we make an effort to chant, Yes, Artarva. If we make it an effort to chant, then we will get the mercy, even if our chanting is not pure. Because Krishna sees, oh, they're trying to chant my holy name. They're trying to associate with me. Let me give them the mercy. So, of course, we want to chant free from offenses. But even if there is offense, help us and keep chanting, and you'll come to the stage of offenseless chanting. It'll, it'll happen in due course of time. Kirtan is nice, but Japa is also as good. <laughs> so sometimes I even think even better. It's between you and Krishna, Japa.
and sweet. It's very much more intimate. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and this chanting is, uh, as they say, antiseptic and prophylactic. Prophylactic means complete protection. Antiseptic means it purifies the consciousness. There's no greater mercy in this age than chanting Hare Krishna. And the Shastras say that of all, what is that verse? Iti so dasakam nam nam, kali kama sanasana, nata paniteyo payo, sarva veda shudrishite, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. This is two verses in one from the Kali Santara Upanishad spoken by Lord Brahma. He said, after searching through all Vedic literature, one cannot find a more sublime and more direct process for self-realization than chanting these 16 rounds, 16 names. Okay. So this is the topmost form of spiritual practice, and it's the embodiment of the full mercy of the Lord, chant Hare Krishna. Whether it's easy or not, just keep chanting, it becomes nicer and nicer. Yeah. Okay, got that? <laughs> so, uh, and there, there are devotees that they just chant all the time. Whether they're, whatever they're doing, they just chant Hare Krishna. Because if you're chanting Hare Krishna, you're connected. You're with Krishna. You're free. I'll tell you one story. There's many stories. This one illustrates many stories. Two of our devotees were preaching in what is now known as Bangladesh. And this was in the war in 1962. No, 72. Right? 71, 72. Yeah. So Prabhupada sent two sannyasis to preach in that area during the war. And uh, it was pushed to Krishna Maharaj and Brahm Brahmananda you know, Maharaj. So they were preaching in the war zone. And they were meeting people. And they, were, they were holding little meetings and trying to teach people Krishna consciousness. But it was becoming dangerous. So Prabhupada was a little concerned that he started writing letters trying to get the devotees to come back, but they, the letters were not going through because of the war. So Prabhupada was concerned about them. And people were also saying, I think you better leave the country. So they decided to leave. And they were, there was a, pro a program where buses were leaving the country with people who wanted to leave. But if they found anybody who was not Islamic, on these buses, because the buses would be stopped at the borders by the Islamic army. And if they found anybody there, they would immediately execute them. So these two devotees got on the bus, the bus got stopped at the border, the army comes, checks it out, finds these two devotees and takes them, puts them in front of a firing squad, They're ready to kill them. So Brahmananda, he's there, he takes out his beads and holds it up in the air and starts chanting really loud, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. So push the Krishna Maharaj does the same thing. And just yelling out the holy name. After some time, the Islamic army, something happened. They got become confused. The leader of the army said, all right, get out of here. Get on the bus and go. The holy name gave them complete protection. Yeah. yeah. I can tell you many stories like that. You know, chant the holy name and then... Of course, giving protection is secondary. The real benefit of chanting is it awakens your attraction for Krishna. It awakens your love for Krishna. What is that verse? Yeah, I remember. But there are many, many verses that glorify the holy name. Uh, Sarva karma, who is it? Sarva karma, karma va, moksha karma udharadi, tivarena bhakti yogena ijeta purusham puram. Whether you are interested in sense gratification, whether you are self realized, whether you are on the path of devotion, whatever, chanarikrishna. <laughs> That's all. 
uh, I can't really emphasize the glories of the holy name enough because it's not possible. But if one, if we seriously and regularly take up chanting Hare Krishna, we will see the difference of our life. Right, Mataji? You're chanting 16 years. Has your life changed for the better? Yeah, you can see she's bright and smiling. <laughs> Some of you are also, but I can't see because you got these. You all look like Jains, a few of you. <laughs> the Jain religion has spread all over the world now. Everybody's wearing masks. <laughs> so, yeah, so anybody who's chanting Hare Krishna will tell you since they began in a serious way, everything has become wonderful. Yeah, that's a fact. And even if there's challenges in life, you're equipped to deal with these challenges by the mercy of the Holy Name. This is Krishna's mercy. It's the full mercy of the Lord. And but this is the song. Jeev Jago, Sleeping on the witch, the lap, the lap of witch of Maya. And she's taking everything from you. Maya is a witch. <laughs> she's not, she's a kickery witch. She's very dangerous. But therefore, Jeep John, and then Enechia Sari Maya, Masi Bhadalagi, Harinama Mahamarjalal Timagi. So this is our this is our good fortune, the chanting of Hare Krishna. Hey, Krishna, hey, Krishna, 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 Hare, 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 Rama, Hare, Rama, 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 Hare, Hare. Hmm? I just smile. You smile. You always smile, don't you? Not about that. <laughs> so, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. The holy name is is everything. That that verse, Kirir Doshani Di Raja Nasti Ekma Mahagun Kirtana in Krishna's Yeah. Mukta Sangam Karangaja. This age is bad. It's very bad. And it's only going to get worse. But this is that bright light in the dark age, the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maharaj. Lord Chaitanya, what is that? What is that? I can't think of it. Kali Kukuda. Kukuda means dog. <laughs> Lord Chaitanya. <laughs> The dog runs away. So Kali Yu is like a dog. What is it? Nam Nam Ray. Bacha go vinda kaho go laha go no bacha go ranga kaha go ranga laha go ranga ma ray 
Chant Goranga's name, glorify Goranga, make Goranga your life. Goranga, 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 Goranga. No more merciful incarnation than Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He's so merciful, so merciful. But if you chant his holy name, you know, the mercy even comes more and more. Hare Krishna. So, this is our only solace in this age. Two things association with devotees in the mood of serving the devotees and chant Hare Krishna. If you do these two things, you'll get everything in Krishna consciousness. Vaishnav Seva, Nam Ruchi, and then Bhakti Vinoda Kaur. He adds the third one, Jivadoya. Mercy to the conditioned souls by giving them an opportunity to chant Hare Krishna also. So this is the threefold process of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chant Hare Krishna, serve the Vaishnavas, preach or give Krishna consciousness to wherever you meet. Lord Chaitanya told Korma Brahma, whoever you meet, tell them about Krishna. Whoever you meet, tell them about chanting Hare Krishna. He said, if you do this, you will always have my association. You will never lose my association. I'm always with you. Yeah. Um, we hear the glories of the Harinam, the Mahamantra, and we try to uh, shine on a regular basis. But some days we are very enthusiastic, some days we are very feeling joyous about chanting, and we really get uh, focused on chanting. And other days, or most other days, <laughs> we don't feel that. So how do we improve our life from not feeling attractive or not feeling uh, enthusiastic about chanting to feeling enthusiastic every day chanting? Well, you believe that the holy name is all you need. What is that, that beautiful prayer? Oh, the holy name is all, what is that one song? Oh, it's, it's an anonymous prayer by a great soul. The holy name of the, the holy name of Sri Hari is all that be. The holy name of Sri Hari is all that be. There's eight verses glorifying the holy name. When you have that faith, that this, whether you feel good or it's difficult, it's easy, chant. Doesn't matter. Even if your chanting is difficult and you're not tasting it and you find it, you know, like sometimes because of the modes of material nature, it becomes easier or harder. And sometimes we also do things that make it difficult. If we eat too much, then we can find it harder to chant. If we eat the wrong food, sometimes we find it harder to chant. So, you know, there's certain things in our life which can enhance or take away from the quality of our chanting. But the, don't worry about that so much. Just try to chat no matter how you feel. Whether you feel good, do it. If you don't feel good, do it. If you feel somewhere, some, somehow half good or half not good, do it. This chant. Yeah. Because Krishna will say, oh, they're, they're struggling to chant my name, so let me give them some mercy. Your effort is part of the success. Krishna's mercy is the complete success. But don't be discouraged. Like today, I found my job was a little bit harder because I was a little tired. 
when sometimes when you're tired, the mind has a tendency to wander easy. So you have to sometimes either stop, take some rest, and get rested, or just somehow or other struggle through that tiredness and keep chanting. But don't give up the chanting because of, because of difficulty. But we need to have that faith. I can tell you like this, but unless you have that faith, then you'll be discouraged by success and failure. Sweet channel. Sweet. Therefore, in order to improve, we should read about the glories of the Holy Name. We should go to the Kirtans. We should chant as much as we can. All of this will bring about greater faith in the chanting of Krishna's name. Yes, Prabhupada. Maharaj, um, how to identify whether we are um, attached to our family or we love our family? Where do we stand? So how to identify that? Well, love means service. If you're serving your family for the benefit of them, that's an indication of the love. But if you're serving your family in order to get something for your own personal, then it's mixed. There's some love and there's some selfishness in there combined. But if this is like, if you think, just like if you have, say, your, your daughter gets sick and you push everything aside just to help her and get her well, then that's love. But that attachment is also there because somehow Krishna has given you that particular soul to take care of. So that's not only an expression of your affection, but it's also a duty that we have to do. Mm -hmm. So we develop love based on our relationship with Krishna. The more we love Krishna, the more we can we can find that love in our relationships with others. But yeah, you have to see: Are we duty bound and doing things out of duty, or are we doing things out of love, or are we doing things because it makes us happy? So, Bhakti Vinoda Kaur is another person who says that people act out of fear out of happiness, out of duty, out of love. These are four motivations for activities. So many people are afraid of this virus. So out of fear, we're doing so many things. So fear is the lowest form of motivation. It's for, they usually give fear to young, young children because they can't understand things. And so you, teach them that if you don't do this, you suffer. <laughs> we don't do that with grown-ups. Grown-ups are not motivated by fear, they're motivated by what is correct and what is not correct. <laughs> and then higher than that is happiness. Oh, I do something because it makes me happy. And if it doesn't make me happy, I don't do it. But higher than that is duty. I'm, because it's my duty, I will do that. It doesn't matter how I feel or how I don't feel, whether it makes me happy or not, it's my duty. So duty is the platform of, of stability, not fear and not happiness. And then the highest platform is we're motivated by love. Love means to actually care for the, for the person you're serving, care for their welfare. So you have to you have to evaluate what is your motivation right there. It's good to be attached to your family, but attached to them because they are Krishna's parts and parcel, not just uh, a family member that happened to be given to you. It's their spirit souls. So when you serve your family, you're serving them as Krishna's parts and parcels. So therefore, you have to give them both not just motherly care and love, but spiritual direction, guidance. Then that's the complete care. Thank you, Shri. Yeah, that's the complete care. 
you care about somebody, then you do something to help them. But sometimes we do things out of duty. And that's all right, because duty will lead to higher knowledge and higher emotions. But you just like, you know, the husband's working, the wife's at home, husband's coming home after a hard day, he's looking forward to a nice dinner, wife's thinking, hmm. What should I cook? Well, I can cook something he likes, but I do that all the time. Let me cook something I like. <laughs> and he'll like it too. So just, the love has gone down a little bit. <laughs> so personal motivation sometimes is mixed in for, with our activities. But, we, but the, the purity of activity is the activity is performed for the benefit of the person you performing the activity is for. And that's bhakti too. You serve Krishna in order to please Krishna and not to get something from it. Like the gopis, they don't care what happens to them as long as they can please Krishna. That's pure love. Mm -hmm. But we can act on the platform of duty, and that keeps us connected in the right, the right mood. That makes sense? Okay, should we stop here? Thank you. Shri Bhagavad Gita, Shri Bhakti Vinoda Kaur, Mahamotsava, Abhyabhav Kija. Thank you.